problematic not only because Dr. Monty has kids, he would like to check out tonight. And I do that. Um, if you don't know me already, my name is Martha. I'm the director of Society of Cannabis Commissions Colorado, a nonprofit professional society for people working with cannabis patients. Now, handouts over here tonight. Are you impaired day? Believe it or not, the things we do cost me money. I know it's shocking. But they do. So we have the handout for if you have someone who would like to donate to this, say a uh, dispensary or clinic or something like that, or even just members of the public, when you go to our coscc.org website and click on the Are You Impaired Day banner, now at the bottom it does have a donation section that says important things like $25 covers a saliva test, and $50 covers a cognition test, and $100 covers a blood test, and the total cost of putting a patient through our whole program on August 27th is $350. So if you do the whole $350, you get a membership for the year and a bunch of other cool stuff. So that's part of that package. And then we also have uh, the study methodology stable to that too, so they can see what we're all about. If you're into study methodology, I know we're all nerds. Some of them are on green paper, but worry not about that. The protocol for our new IRB that I'm still working on that's in process is included. And I do want comments from everybody on this because I've never written an IRB protocol myself before, but I have read many of them. So anyway, please take that, take a look at it, and get back to me. Now, speaking of our IRB, um, as we announced at our last meeting, uh, instead of using the Biomed Cannabis IRB that several of our members are participating in, uh, we are simply looking to form our own IRB, and Ray Gottesfeld has offered to head that. Paul Bregman's going to be on it. Uh, Dr. Gray is interested. Anyone else who's interested in being on the IRB, please let me know. And also, we need volunteers for Are You Impaired Day for vital signs, blood draws, checking people in, um, you know, directing people to parking and things like that. So please sign up to volunteer. If not, I'll be emailing everyone and demanding. Now, everyone knows that our new, our new fundraiser is the New Patient Success Guide. Um, these cost me right now about 80 cents each to print on my home kitchen computer, but we can drop that to 56 cents when we send them out, and then they'll be on nice and paper. But what I'm showing you here tonight, Undo is our sponsor for tonight, and these are branded for Undo, so you can see how this can be branded for your dispensary or clinic. So here's ones that are branded for my clinic, Healthy Choices, and my logo on the front. And on the back, it has a phone number and a place for us to write the name of the doctor that you saw. Um, and we can write these out for anyone. We're trying to sell them for $2 a piece. All donations are tax deductible, as always. And you do need to buy a certain number to get this. Now, we will be raising our individual member rate on August 1st from $60 a year to $99 a year. And I'm sorry to have to do this to everybody, but I got to do it. Now, keep this in mind that we are still $50 cheaper than joining Society of Cannabis Clinicians in California. So this is still the best deal you get. And you still do get all of Society of Cannabis, Cannabis Clinicians California information because Dr. Bregman happily posts it on our blog every time that they send out a new news release. So we can all read it on our website. Well, but I'll try. <laughs> try. So booklets uh, are here for everyone to take and look at and review. And once again, as always, I did send these out for comments the last two meetings, and the number of people who commented was one, and that was Paul. So the rest of you slackers, let me know if there's anything that needs to be changed or if I got anything wrong or something that needs to be added. OK, for those of you who have not yet, the undue samples from our sponsor. There's some here on the counter. This is a cannabis emergency formula that they say that what it does, although, and this is a patent pending formula, I've read the patent. They say that it actually pushes the THC off the CB1 receptor briefly, and that that is how it works, and replaces it with this extract of, of lichen, the stuff that reindeer eat off rocks, that they have been testing as uh, you know, a, a CD1 receptor clearer. Mm -hmm. Right. I have personally tried this um, because I'm one of those people who is really allergic to molds, and every now and then I take a hit, and within 10 minutes I am vomiting like a lot for a long time. This worked great. <laughs> so try it for your patients as well. She's hoping to get some emergency room tests, which brings us to. Our speaker tonight, which is why I do as our sponsor for tonight, this is Dr. Andrew Monti. And Dr. Andrew Monti is an emergency room specialist who has had patients come in with cannabis hyperemesis 
and I'm not going to talk about it more because he's here to tell us all about it. So thanks, yeah, well, thanks so much. <laughs> So again, I'm Andrew Monti. I am an emergency physician and I'm a medical toxicologist at the University of Colorado. And then I also um, uh, do some work for the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Center in my toxicology role. So right, so I am a specialist in sort of the adverse drug events of sort of all drugs, right? That's pharmaceuticals, that's environmental toxins, you know, I take air snake bites and all that stuff, and so that's kind of what my specialty is. I've certainly recognized some people in the room, um, and I've seen, um, you know, who've probably heard me at, at meetings and things along those lines. Um, and so I will tell you a little bit about what we hope to accomplish here. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what is known about this particular syndrome, a little bit about what's not known, right? Like, and how I think actually this group here can actually help contribute to the knowledge base on this, because I actually think that that second bullet up there, what is not known, is much, much bigger than people like to believe, right? Um, especially in the traditional med um, uh, medicine world. And so these are sort of my disclosures. I am a researcher. I do actually primarily um, personalized medicine work. That's what I am funded for through the National Institutes of Health. I, um, you know, so I, I work on sort of preventing adverse drug events um, through genetics and things along those lines. That's actually what my, my funding is. Um, I am, however, funded for um, to look at the adverse drug events from edible cannabis products because there's this, you know, feeling that if people have large doses of edibles, right, actually they may be more toxic than the inhaled version. And so this is a one-year grant from the Department of Public Health in order to look at this particular you know, question, right? And again, we don't know what, um, which that, what that will find. Um, and I also sit on a data safety monitoring board for clinical trials, looking at um, cannabidiol for clinical um, conditions. And so my role in that, again, I'm a, a medical toxicologist, so I deal with adverse drug events. And so we help guide them, okay, so this particular product, this person's liver enzymes went up. Is that due to the cannabidiol or is it not, right? So that's what my job is, and to look at that in a very sort of balanced and, and um, not biased way. So my views, I think I should just tell you right off the bat, right, is that I clearly believe that cannabis has medical indications, okay? That is, um, I think that is incontrovertible, and I know I don't need to convince you all of that, but that is the way, what I believe. I also, however, believe that as a therapeutic, there are adverse drug events, just like there are with every drug or everything that we use for medical purposes. Right? Too much of anything, including water, can be harmful. And so that's a critical to understand. Okay? Um, so, I mean, do you guys see patients with cannabinoid hyperanalysis? Do you guys see these patients? Yeah? How often? So far, I've called it cyclical vomiting yeah. syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's what it is, really. The definition is the same. The, um, and we'll sort of go over what the evidence says on this. The definition is the same, but it's just simply associated with two different things, and that's heavy cannabis use, right? And then actually these hot showers, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit as well. Yeah. I've had one patient out of 10,000 report yeah. having cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, and it was strain specific, and that strain yeah. had not been tested for mold. So, Martha, you came to a meeting at the Department of Public Health Retail, um, you know, Public Health Advisor Committee, and you mentioned that to me. And I should say that so we did a systematic review on this particular topic, and because of that statement, right, I added an additional sentence into that saying, "Listen, we don't know." And actually, I actually put that anecdote into this manuscript because of that type of thing. Again, we are. As a clinician, as an emergency physician, what do I see? I see when stuff goes wrong, right? And I am very much understanding and respectful that that is not the majority of people, right? And so my view is biased in that way, but I'm very open to the possibility um, that, you know, we're seeing, and, and I believe that we're seeing a very small fraction of users that are coming in with this condition, right? And so, like, again, I think that you folks see a lot more patients and treat a lot more patients than I ever will with cannabis. And so that perspective is really important and important to actually get out there. And we, you know, we'll talk a bit about that. Anybody else treated yeah, patients? This comes from a uh, head of a 18,000 person clinic yeah. in me. So what he, the only addition to this, he doesn't see it very often. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Yeah. But he is seeing it more. 
two, three times more on people who are coming off of opiates and are substituting cannabis for opiates. Interesting. And, and, and you wonder if that's they made that. He told me this, you know, but I didn't see it. But he told me that's what he's noticing mm. as he's from the other doctors who are in this clinic, mm. not himself. And he just wanted to make that specific point. Interesting. Yeah. I'll tell you, uh, one thing that really troubles me is that at least in the local emergency room that I'm familiar with, patients who come in who are vomiting, who uh, also yeah. use cannabis are treated with extreme hostility from yes. the get-go. I think you are exactly right. And I actually talked with another physician who's also a medical toxicologist. Um, uh, we talked about this today. Uh, just the, the, and number one, and I'll make this point later as well, you know, vomiting and even cyclic vomiting plus cannabis use doesn't equal cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. It's a really important point. And, you know, physicians need to understand that this is a syndrome that, and there are sort of criteria for it. And it doesn't mean that just because you smoke pot and you vomit, that, that's not the syndrome, right? Like, everybody vomits every now and again, right? Like, and so that, that isn't necessarily it. And you're right, I think that clinicians in the emergency departments have become frustrated with treating these patients, right? And I will tell you that they can be frustrating to deal with because actually they, they vomit a ton. They're recalcitrant to most treatments. Like we give them a lot of different medicines and they actually don't respond well like normal people would. So if somebody comes in with a viral infection, we're able to get that person under control pretty easily. But these patients with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome are really difficult to treat. And you know, so we sort of talk about these other potential treatments. I think that there's a real potential and a void for those types of things. Just, yeah. Are, are sponsors hoping you'll take some samples yeah. and try it out people? Just to let you know, one particular patient who I called hyper uh, uh, cyclical vomiting yeah. goes to the ER. He knows what helps him, and that's a combination of nubane, benzyl, mm -hmm. and fenugreek, mm -hmm. and uh, it, st it stops the symptoms yeah. pretty quick. So sure, sure. Well, let's go, let's move on. So you know, um, just you know, setting the stage here, right? We know almost 300 million people worldwide use cannabis. That's about almost five percent of the population worldwide. Why? Okay. Um, in 2014, 22 million um, Americans aged 12 and older were current cannabis users. So, um, you know, the, and that was 8.4 percent of the U.S. population. Um, 26 states and, and Washington D.C. have laws allowing cannabis in some form in the U.S. We, at the most recent data in the in the um, Colorado Department of Public Health report, is that one in eight Colorado adults actually use um, daily or near daily. Okay, so that's actually a lot of people, one in eight, right? Daily or near daily. Um, you know, however, quantifying medical use is much harder, and we actually don't have a good way. That's sort of all cannabis use, and I'm not convinced that, you know, medical use precipitates this syndrome as often as non medical right? I, you know, I heard some talk about dabbing earlier, and typically people don't use a lot of dabbing for medical purposes, right? Like, the, the intent is different when people are dabbing in general, right? Like, this is a generality, than it is when they're sort of treating a medical condition, right? And so, um, the problem is, is, you know, people have these, you know, the, what we used to call red cards, right? Because it, they're the tax benefit, right? So we can't really sort of track who's doing this truly for medical purposes and who's uh, doing it for just recreational purposes. And I think that there's probably a mix in there as well. And so it's hard to really kind of know what is what when we sort of think about this condition and which patients are actually really um, at risk of this particular condition, right? So, um, you know, clearly I, I said I, I believe there are, are medical indications for cannabis. Certainly um, there, the literature on appetite stimulation, um, you know, 2.5 milligrams of THC twice daily stimulated appetite um, in, in patients. They didn't find that there was any benefit on, um, on quality of life in a phase three clinical trial, and they didn't find a benefit on appetite, but this clearly has been, this has been demonstrated several times, and it is an appetite stimulant. Notice the dose, 2.5 milligrams. That's relatively low, right? Um, seizures, we know that uh, Dravet's syndrome, um, you know, and there are other, other recalcitrant uh, syndrome, cannabidiol has been known, is effective for that. I don't think that all seizure disorders are the same, and I don't think that actually treating all <coughs> seizures um, is, a, you know, 
THC and or cannabinoids are appropriate for all seizure disorders. But I think that we don't know which ones, which particular disorders actually are effective, and frankly, which cannabinoids, or whether or not which combination of cannabinoids with this entourage effect that we've discussed, um, really kind of does this, right? And so we're still learning about this is the point, but clearly, actually, this is effective for some conditions. Um, you know, there's a bunch of clinical trials in this particular space, right? Um, I mentioned that I sit on um, this particular uh, data safety monitoring board um, to review the, the data on, on the, these trials. The point is there's just a lot of stuff out there, okay? Chronic pain, right? We talked about opioids a little bit here. Um, you know, so I regularly see patients come into the emergency department with pain, right? It's the most common reason patients come to the emergency department. And so when somebody has an ankle sprain, and um, you know, I don't think that opiates are the best thing for all the reasons that have been highlighted in the news, right? Um, it is clear, they are clearly intoxicating, they're clearly addicting. And so yes, I talk to patients about potentially using cannabinoids when they are open to those things, right? Especially if somebody comes in and I, you know, they smell like marijuana, that's a good time to have that opportunity and talk to them. Because guess what I don't want to do? I don't want to give somebody um, that already has another method a, a new potential drug that can have adverse drug events, right? So having this conversation with people and letting them know what, what to do and how to do it is the right thing to do. Can I ask you a short, a briefly thing yeah. about what conversation, what kind of conversation you have? Yeah, so basically what I will do, you know, let's just say it's an ankle sprain patient. Or, or I'll, I'll, I'll use an example of a patient that I um, had today. Um, uh, well, I'll describe two, two situations, and I think that'll be more clear. So ankle sprain patient, just generally, right? Patient comes in, um, you know, it's a young man, they've got an ankle sprain, and said, you know, this really hurts. Um, you know, I say, okay, well, you know, did you try ibuprofen? You know, uh, did that work for you? No. Um, well, you know, I smell a little bit of marijuana. Have you tried that for it? Yes. Okay, did that work for you? Okay, great. You know, and then we talk about actually the, the kinetics of this, and we'll sort of talk about this afterward. You know, smoking versus um, edible agents. Generally, what the doses are um, for pain control, and we can kind of come back here. And these were all these kind of studies generally were kind of five to ten milligrams of uh, THC and/or dronabinol. Uh, and so we know that that's the dose that is effective for pain control. Now, to be fair, there's tolerance, and so you sort of have to um, you know titrate a bit, like you would with any medicine. But I generally recommend starting like we would with other therapies at a low dose and increasing if needed, right? And then I also tell them this stuff, right? That there, um, the, this particular trial showed that there were adverse drug events as well. I mean, these are the types of things that we see in any clinical trial, right? Sometimes some people get a little bit nauseous, right? Um, you know, some people get a little bit of quote unquote euphoria or blurred vision. Um, so I, I let them know, just like I do with any other medication that I would prescribe, these are the potential side effects, this is what you should be aware of. Um, generally, you know, side effects for all medicines are lower at lower doses, right? So that's why we generally try to start low. So that's the conversation I would have with somebody that we would ha um, be treating for sort of a musculoskeletal type of thing. So will you write a script off for marinol? No, so, so what, for marinol. For marinol. So I actually don't tend to um, write Marinol, and here's why. Because it's expensive, it's exceptionally expensive, okay. right? And people, um, uh, it is actually more, it, it's inex more in inexpensive to actually go to a dispensary and get it. Got so it. Uh, generally that would be my recommendation. Um, and you know, like I, I also um, suggest, you know, if it's a topical muscular thing, they can try creams and things like that because you know, theoretically, that's not going to have the systemic exposure, so you should be at lower risk of this type of stuff. Well, you mentioned THC and CBD and things like that. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. We, we talked through that stuff. So. Do you ever offer suggestions of combinations of, of those like Tavanol and, and cannabis or ibuprofen and cannabis? So I generally, in general, I recommend over-the-counter um, you know, Tylenol and ibuprofen, to, you know, to, assuming somebody doesn't have a kidney problem or, or liver problem, um, I recommend that as my first line therapy. If there are contraindications, somebody's like, you know, had acid reflux and they're at risk of a GI bleed or if they've got kidney trouble, then I won't recommend that stuff. Uh, but yes, I recommend starting with that and if they don't feel better within an hour, then uh, moving to the next sort of line therapy is generally the way. I've, I've noticed, the reason I say that is I've noticed 
sometimes either cannabis or Tylenol doesn't resolve the pain yeah. you know, associated with ski injuries. Okay. And the combination of the two does a great job. Well, that, that's a very well-known clinical phenomenon with other uh, medications. And you know, frankly, the best literature on this is actually opiates. Um, you know, the one plus one equals three type of phenomenon actually with opiates has been demonstrated really well because there were just so many clinical trials with you know Percocet versus oxycodone versus Tylenol alone. Um, you know, they ran nice clinical trials. We unfortunately now prescribe too much oxycodone, but um, but you know clearly that's a very well uh, recognized phenomenon. But let me just add, with, with regards to the non-steroidal stuff, yeah. I don't run across too many physicians who are telling people at what levels to stop. Yeah. Because I think not only is it an opioid epidemic in the state, but even a bigger silent thing is the fact that yeah. what people take over the counter sure. is liver and yeah. kidneys type of situation. Yeah. And that's not brought forth by traditional medicine as well. I think with every medication that we prescribe and we suggest, there needs to be a um, dose range and a duration that is attended to that, right? So generally when we sort of, when I prescribe ibuprofen, for instance, I only do it for seven to 10 days at a, at a maximum. I don't go for longer than that because again, that's when you start to get into issues with you know, uh, renal injuries and, and more of the gastrointestinal bleeding type of things. Um, and so then I was going to tell you about a second patient. So the second patient I had today, right, was a um, patient that was an asthmatic. They happened to come in for a rash, actually. So they had a hypersensitivity. They're sort of like an atopic person. So they have hives, right, and had um, asthma. They're, they were wheezing a little bit. Um, and he, he happened to mention that he was an everyday cannabis um, smoker. And so we sort of had this conversation, right? So what do we know about smoking marijuana in asthmatics. What we know is, is that actually acutely it increases um, airway bronch bronchodilation. So you smoke, actually your airways get, get bronchodilated. It increases your FEV1, or how much you can breathe out in a second, right? The problem is, is if you smoke every day, then actually you have a higher risk of bronchitis and respiratory infections. However, that risk, you don't get that with edible labor. Right? But you still get the bronchodilation. So for a patient like that that wants to use you know, cannabinoids every day, actually edibles are a much better option for him right? because he's not going to sort of have this other attendant risk of getting um, infections that can make his asthma worse. Right? You're sort of using something that makes you better right away but actually causes more asthma exacerbations if you smoke all the time. Right? So those are, that's a different conversation, not necessarily a therapeutic button, but just how he would use it. Yeah. So, um, to avoid smoking, would it potentially be beneficial to instead of suggesting an edible, which, as you very well know, produces the 11 hydroxy effect, um, couldn't you just recommend a, uh, a delta 9 uh, transdermal and just have a patch? And Theoretically, yes, absolutely. You know, and, and kind of like I, avoid the whole cockamamie experience of what an edible produces and still benefit the patient. And I think that that's um, certainly an option, right? I don't traditionally recommend that very often. I frankly just don't know how um, how much of that product is available. I mean, I, I certainly know it is available, but um, you know, I guess I don't think about that as a uh, kind of systemic uh, treatment for people. And frankly, I just don't know if a transdermal, if that actually produces the same bronchodilation. I don't think it's ever been studied. Sure. You know? And I'm just yeah. assuming that yeah. tincture, sure, it's a good question. tincture would probably make more sense than transdermals. And perhaps. Perhaps, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah from from so, what I know, the transdermals are not, there's no pharmacokinetic tests that I know of on the transdermals at this right. point. But the other thing that we do know is there's up to eight cannabinoid receptors. And by activating in the skin, we get a systemic response within a couple of days, even with the ones that don't pull into the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we just, we need a study. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so, you know, for this, um, this was a study that was in JAMA a couple of years ago now that they basically modeled uh, places that actually had mortality associated with opioids. Um, and they actually found that there would be lower mortality in places that actually had liberalized uh, cannabis. Okay. Clearly, you know, this has been studied for chemotherapy-induced uh, nausea. I mean, this is one of the, uh, the cleanest indications actually out there in the literature where we know it's as effective, okay? So look at all of these studies, right? So 10 to 50 milligrams, uh, 10 milligrams per meter squared, like, you know, 
15 milligrams orally, and you look at the, the results here, THC better than prochlorperazine, THC better than prochlorperazine, now this is Phenergan essentially, right? Um, better than all of this stuff, of these other traditional anti-emetics, okay? Um, you know, and so clearly the literature actually supports this use. Yeah? What is prochlorperazine? It's Phenergan, which is an anti-nausea medicine that is actually one of the traditional ones that we use. Um, it's a very, very common one. Yeah, and, and it was the traditional way is that, that Zofran? It's actually not. Zofran is on Dancitron. Um, you know, uh, Prochlorperazine is Phenergan. Um, it's just another, you know, really probably the top three antiemetics that we use are Zofran, Reglan, which is uh, metoclopramide, which was down here, and then, and then Prochlorperazine. Those three are the most common ones we use. So you know, head to head with the sort of most common one of the one most common ones, this was the this was the most common in the times that we used. Then they were doing these studies. It was better than that, right? This was, however, look, they're sort of saying THC here. This was not actually just THC though, and that should be noted, right? Like this was generally um, these were extracts, and so these, this wasn't just THC. This is just the way they they were sort of dosing the the pills, just like we do with edibles. Now, okay. So THC is clearly effective for chemotherapy induced, uh, you know, associated nausea. You know, and there's lots of other um, conditions where this is effective. We should know that. But again, you know, there are benefits to this, but there are also risks, right? And so we just need to sort of be aware of that and be able to tell our patients about the risks when they do these things as well. Okay. So what do we know about this condition? This condition was only first reported in 2004. Okay. It's a syndrome of cyclic vomiting associated with chronic high dose cannabis use um, that's frequently associated with this compulsive hot bathing to control symptoms. Okay. So people like their hot water bills are, are enormous, right? This is the thing that seems to help them. And I'm, um, you know, we'll sort of talk about it a little bit. We've already talked about this as well. Vomiting plus cannabis use doesn't mean that that's cannabidiol hyperemesis syndrome, you know? People vomit uh, every now and again when they get sick, when they get food poisoning, when they get all sorts of things. So um, this was a study we did actually when we started to actually see more of the cyclic vomiting. So this was actually in the pre-medical liberalization and the post-medical liberalization. And we saw a doubling of the rate of, uh, uh, of cyclic vomiting. This was not, these patients were not diagnosed with cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. These patients were diagnosed with cyclic vomiting. So that should be very clear. It may be that not all of these patients were um, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. But the fact of the matter is, is we saw you know, a doubling of the rate, okay? 41 out of 113 ED visits versus 87 out of 125. I mean, this was actually um, you know, pretty profound to me. I wasn't convinced, frankly, that we were seeing a lot more of this before, before we looked at these data. I really actually didn't think that we would see an increase. Um, I was amazed, actually. I just thought that people were saying, eh, well, you know, um, they were calling people that were vomiting, you know, CHS. But we actually were very strict with our definitions here. We said, okay, listen, they have to have three or more visits for nausea and vomiting. That's actually what the definition of sacred vomiting is. Okay. So um, what does our data look like at the University of Colorado? Between 2012 and 2014, we pulled all the ICD codes with uh, cannabis um, codes, ICD codes, right? So there are 2,603 ED visits associated with cannabis over this three-year time period. That's actually not a lot, right? Like we see about 100,000 patients per year. So out of these, these people had cannabis codes. But some of those, these codes were like, okay, I used once in 1962 and I haven't used since, right? So we went through every single one of these records and actually you know, said, okay, well, is this visit actually associated with cannabis use, right? And we only found 906 of all of these out of 300,000 visits that were, had, were associated with cannabis, okay? About 300 of those, so a third of them, were actually cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. This is the single most sort of common condition that brings patients to the emergency department. Yeah. <laughs> associated with cannabis, that is. Right, and so when you say associated with cannabis, yeah. has any of these studies then, or currently, with CDPHE, measuring the difference between smoked flour right. 
The answer Jabbing is Jabbing no. concentrates. The edibles. answer is no. So, so what we, what I hope to do is actually look at the difference between the edibles and the um, and the flour. Uh, part of the methods of that study actually is that we have to actually control for sales, right? Because actually, there's a lot more flour out there than there is edible, right? Even though the dollar amount for edibles that that are created from edibles, actually, the amount of THC, you know, if we use that as a surrogate, is actually much lower sold in edibles than it is about, um, you know, for for flour. And so if we sort of think about that, right, like if we say, okay, well, there are 100 cases due to edibles and there are, you know, 200 cases due to flour, right, people smoking, then, um, but there's like, you know, half as much edible, then actually those things are the same, right? No. Well, because 11 hydroxy, like when you ingest THC, it does become exponential. Yeah. And so I yeah. don't think you could measure that as the same. Uh, but yeah. Well, you don't measure them the same. The, the point, the, I guess, the point is, is that you have to control. It. Like, so the effects are clearly different, and, and that's what I, you know, I'm acknowledging, right? Yeah. And so I think that that's what we need to look at. But we need to be able to kind of standardize this to the products in the marketplace in some way, right? Like, because otherwise we can't say, you know, 50 cases of edible versus 50 cases of flour is actually not the not the same on a population level if there's so much more flour out there. And if we saw, say we saw 100 cases due to dermal, you know, just hypersensitivity, that's not what we would see, but let's just say that. That would actually be a much bigger deal, right? Because that rate of adverse drug events is much, much higher, right? Because we just don't, people don't use it as much, right? And so, so those are the types of questions that need to be asked. Has anybody done it yet? No. And, and I, I think it would be critical to do, just from a dispensary perspective, what you get is a lot of people who have smoked flour from all these different states Absolutely. for years and years. Absolutely. But they come to the cannabis state Absolutely. and try an edible for the first time yep. so because bud tenders aren't trained or certified to explain them to patients. All of these people who are used to smoking flour who've never had a problem eat an edible and have a serious situation Absolutely. and tons of people are going to hospital for Exactly. Them. And so these are things that we say to each other in this room and, and amongst sort of like people in the hallways anecdotally, but actually nobody has ever really sort of demonstrated this. And how do we craft public health messaging around that when there's no data, right? And so what you're describing is exactly what needs to be done, is actually look at this in a systematic way so that we can say, hey, look, actually this is a bigger deal and what we need to do is actually be advising our patients more. I mean, you know, a billboard every now and again is just not all that effective, right? <laughs> yeah. I have a question regarding, so what you were saying before, the you know, sorry, consumption of cannabis and vomiting does not equal the, the same yeah. here. Yeah. Now, when you're saying that approximately 300 of these were considered this, yeah. to be part of the syndrome, were they coming back on a free, on a free so basis? They were. So they were. And so that's the other important piece here, right? 300 of these, these are 300 visits, not 300 patients. And right. that's a critical piece, right? So, so, maybe so like it could have been 50 patients coming back. Like. Exactly. Yeah. And, I, and we're sort of going through these data to tell you exactly what that number is. I actually think it's about, um, because the, the, our definition is essentially that they have to have, um, uh, you know, three visits within a year. That's what the definition is, actually. Okay. And so over this time period, then we'll, even though we kind of look out at 2015 and, you know, maybe at 2012 and 11, in order to kind of get that, generally we see all about 300 of these. Yeah, okay. Well, and I still believe that we've got issues with molds and contaminants yeah. and residual solvents and residual pesticides and things like that. Um, sure. And, you know, if we could have a way to ask the people who are coming in with this syndrome, bring in a sample. Yeah. Right now we do not test for mold and fungus. And there are, you know, trimmers everywhere will tell you the dirty secrets of trimmers, that they trim the mold off the buds and those are the ones that go into the edible batches. So we might see this overrepresented with edibles, but not because of cannabinoids, yep. but because of contaminants. It's certainly possible. So you have 300 visits. Yep. And that may comprise 20 people. So it could be possible, right? It's more than that. I, I've looked at the records a, a little bit. It, it's over 100 is what I would say. It's over 100 yeah. in a double type of situation. And, and you don't know, you can obviously ask the person, have they consumed the edible versus have they smoked, right? right. So that will make a big, that helps immensely, in, right. my, in my opinion, to a degree. Yeah. Because let's say, 80% of the people that came in got it from concentrates and inhalation. 
That's a pretty profound statement that you can just make right there. And the numbers that you're dealing with are so relatively small, even though they're increasing. Absolutely. You don't know what's coming in. It's like, what is, why is there such, why do you need to go beyond the fact of what you, what you use, the type that you use, and that's where you're at, and make few decisions from that point, and not have to waste. It's not a waste, it's just a matter of, I think the answers are right here. Well, so, so I think that they are, but here's the problem, right, is that um, physicians don't necessarily ask all those questions, nor are they always well documented in the medical record. Right? Like, just like I told you how clinicians are saying, oh, you puked and, and you smoke pot, that means you've got cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And you know, my job is to educate them that that's not the case. Fine. Right? What we also have to do is ask them to ask those questions that you just described. Right? And actually get that stuff in the literature so that we can look at it, or in our records, so that we can actually go back and parse out that stuff. You know, very often, I don't know, when I look at a record, okay, I can't tell whether or not this person, you know, vaped. Did they, you know, um, did they smoke a bong? Did they? I have no idea. Did they eat an edible? I have no idea from the documentation. Just plus pot, you know, like that's what it says, right? Like, and so, I, so in order to do that, we have to sort of, you know, make some assumptions in this uh, in this area that makes it more difficult, right? Yeah. Um, I know that you said that you do have a focus specifically in edibles. Uh, so, so I don't. Not focused, but yeah. it's funded through the. Edible. Yes, right. So, with that said, um, with all this said, how much focus do you guys have on specifically looking at um, all the different types of concentrates and what equates to what that is sure. separate from edibles and separate from smoke flowers? So, the answer um, in, in brief is that I don't, right? Like, my major research area is personalized medicine stuff. I do a little bit of this work because I think it's important for sort of public health purposes, but I don't do sort of testing on people. I don't draw blood samples on them. We don't sort of kind of do that more specific stuff just because I only have so much time in my day, right? Like, and so, um, so I don't. I think that it's a need and a void that needs to be filled. And people are starting to become interested. And when, I, basically one of the things that I've done at the University of Colorado Colorado has said, listen, I've got all this data. If you anybody wants to come and ask a question and start to look at these patients, I'm happy to sort of help give it to you, help give you some resources through the what funding that we have to ask those questions. Because again, I only have so much time in, in the day, and I think that you know there's a lot of questions that are left unanswered. Yeah. So let's keep moving on here. Um, uh, let's yeah. So 300. So the other visits were a combination of things. There were some. Um, you know, psychiatric visits. I'm not totally sure that um, all of those were due to cannabis, but you know, like because people come in with panic attacks after eating um, or smoking too much, right? You have some of that. But then other people are, you know, this that psychiatric group is a little bit overrepresented because when people come in suicidal, they always get a urine toxicology screen, and there's marijuana in a lot of them, right? Just because we have more marijuana in the community, that doesn't mean that. The marijuana is causing their depression, right? Like that just means again, it's an association. Right? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't really like, so you might have answered this, but do you know whether these patients were actually people from Colorado or were they out of state? What percentage? The cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome specifically, or are these 906? Um, of the 2,603. So it was a combination. There was a higher uh, of this group. There was a high. Well, a um, a the rate in People coming from out of state was was higher, right? So so people in like you know we see a lot more patients from Colorado, and so the rate of visits and that's that makes sense, right? Like their their visitors are coming, they're on vacation. It's like going to Vegas and drinking too much, right? Like there are more people from, in Vegas emergency departments with alcohol poisoning, you know, from out of state as well. And so 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 yes, while while the majority are still can um, Colorado, it's just because we see more Colorado residents, right? You know, but but the rate is higher in out of stairs. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's I'll, I'll talk to you later about it. Okay, sure. So, um, what are the criteria for diagnosis? So, you know, I, I mentioned this kind of systematic review that we did just to kind of see what was out there and what patients actually had. Um, regular cannabis use of any duration of time. So, that just means. Um, you know, generally, I, I actually don't necessarily um, think that they 
most of the studies captured how long people had to be smoking. I actually think that people need to use for quite some time before they develop this syndrome. People don't tend to use for a week and then develop this syndrome. It's actually years, generally, right? In my experience when I see these patients. They get these cyclic vomiting, right? At least weekly cannabis use is what, one, uh, what, what the studies sort of said. And um, I actually think that it's more, you know, like, like multiple times per day, right, is what I see clinically. Um, resolution of symptoms after stopping cannabis, um, hot bathing in 92%. I think, frankly, the other 7.7% you know, .7 of these people just hadn't figured it out yet. You know? um, and um, most of these people are males. I mean, this is just kind of actually consistent with the, the, the recreational utilization pattern in Colorado. This is just representative of that. Um, a lot of people get abdominal pain. Um, there was this kind of uh, this um, comment as well about getting sort of um, you know, pain medications when these patients come in, and a lot of patients have abdominal pain here, so very often they will get opiates with that. So why does cannabis help with nausea, but also cause the cyclic vomiting syndrome, right? Well, why does that happen? And the answer is, in short, we, we really don't know. We have no idea, okay? There's a lot of theories out there, okay? Um, THC, increasing THC is one um, suggestion. And again, you know, when we sort of talked about 2004, this was when this kind of syndrome was first recognized. You see, that's when we're sort of starting to get up into this higher concentration. And you guys know that we're, we now up here, are up here somewhere, right? Like 18%, I think, is what the average is in, in Colorado. Right? But we don't see much of the cannabidiol treatment uh, or content in, um, in um, these products actually increasing. You know, in the medical community, the patients that you see where you're using a lot more cannabidiol, I mean, I think that you guys are seeing less of this than, you know, certainly I'm seeing in the emergency department. Again, I've got a biased sort of view, right? I mean, I see more adverse drug events from the anticoagulants and from the heart medications that are prescribed as well. And so my view gets sort of um, skewed in that way. Okay. Let me just add. Yeah. So, but if you were to hypothesize yeah. to say, okay, what would cause it? And so the cannabis receptors are in the area of the brain that control vomiting and things like that. It could, one of the first, first theories could be that in that area, there's either too much or too little. Something's going on yeah. in the area that controls vomiting and nausea and things like that. Absolutely. So, do to nail that down. If I and, and with that, what would be your theory? CB1 receptors, yeah. CB2. So What's that, going on there? I, I actually think that what happens is you get this kind of constitutively active um, CB1 receptor. That's what I think is happening. And part of the reason why I think that um, now, to be fair, fair, right? There are no animal studies that have looked at this, right? There is no sort of, nobody's done functional MRIs on these patients that have had this stuff. Nobody has done any real true pathophysiologic testing. But I will say that we do see this with synthetic cannabinoids where we know they work and bind predominantly to CB1 receptors. And so that's why I think that CB1 is probably how this happens exactly why and exactly you know how this turns goes from a sort of like on off state to a on state is unclear to me so um, your timeline is critical to this mm -hmm. i believe mm -hmm. and um, i have a theory a little bit different from the cb1 receptor sure. but particularly to your timeline mm -hmm. us human beings mm -hmm. have really enjoyed cannabis as smoked flour Yep. edibles and hashish mm -hmm. up until around 2005. Mm -hmm. And around 2005, when you first start seeing this happening, we have something brand new that we've never experienced, concentrates. Mm -hmm. And so, yep. and when I started sure. in the dispensary, all sure. of the hashes we were selling was mm -hmm. bubble, key, and temple ball. Mm -hmm. Those don't exist in dispensaries anymore because all the kids on the block are really hip to Wax, shatter, shatter yeah. live resin, distillate, isolate, rosin, and now I see that you've got this thing called pesticides. Then we also have fungicides, which are concentrated. Absolutely. But what about um, all of the uh, extraction methods of butane, propane, hexane, all the different isos? When you combine um, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, pesticides, fungicides, high levels of metals, 
in flammable substances that you're freebasing straight to your brain. Yep. I have to be the one to tell you that I think that out of 100 people that have the syndrome, one of them may be from smoked flour, four of them may be from an edible, and 95% of them are probably from concentrates, as I've experienced with people that I well, know. So, so let, me, um, let me actually push back um, on that a little bit, and, here, and here's what I've, uh, I've seen, right? So I have um, one particular patient, right, that I took care of that actually developed this when he was dabbing, you know, initially, right? So he got this kind of condition, is dabbing, now actually, so we have treated him in a, a couple of different ways, right? First thing we did was actually try and just switch him over to, um, you know, to a flower that actually didn't have as high um, concentration. Still actually getting the condition. Decrease the frequency, you know, smoking and things. Still got the condition. I would say that actually in, this, is being, this phenomenon is being seen outside of um, Colorado. And in fact, actually, the first place where this was described was Minnesota, where dabbing, you know, isn't all that common, right? And so I guess I, um, while all of these different things could be the, the reason, I guess I have a hard time sort of saying that because it's so widespread, it seems to be not just a product specific thing, right? I have a hard time thinking that it's just one particular pesticide or one particular fungicide because we're seeing this all over the country, right? In areas that have different use patterns, which indicates to me there's something inherent to the product it's the products across the board right and so whether or not that is a cannabinoid that we haven't identified like it's a specific cannabinoid maybe it's not THC in fact you know maybe it's a combination of different cannabinoids we just don't know but the other thing that I had pointed out earlier is right like one in eight Coloradans actually smoke cannabis daily and we're talking about 300 cases a year. That's like a small number, right? Like that's a really small number. But the fact of the matter is we have no idea what the incidence of this condition is, right? Because we don't have we don't follow a cohort of people that just start smoking smoking and just start dabbing, just start using whatever, and we don't sort of say, okay, well what person gets, you know, psychotic? What person gets um, you know, more depressed? What person, you know, gets uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. What person's depression gets better? What person's multiple sclerosis gets better? We just actually, we don't, we haven't done that yet, right? Like, and that's something that needs to be done. But, you know, generally, because of how widespread it is and because of the range of products across the country, I feel like there's something inherent um, to, to this particular condition, and I think that that's why I think it comes through. So phytocannabinoids traditionally have a yep. weak binding action at the CB1 receptor, sure. whereas synthetic cannabinoids have a strong yep. binding action. K2, spice, those, those manufactured ones. Do you see this in things like K2 and spice and so, possibly yes. even so, so patients that chronically use, like, you know, uh, would be kind of classified as, as um, heavy synthetic, synthetic cannabinoid, cannabinoid yeah. users get this condition. More often than people are using flour, or we don't know? Um, we don't know, because, you know, frankly, we just have, rel we have fewer patients that use synthetic cannabinoids regularly. Generally, people use it, like, you know, on the weekends type of thing. And we, you know, I, I see about five patients a month who use synthetic cannabinoids and end up in my emergency apartment. I mean, think about, like, how many patients I saw in the emergency apartment today. I mean, you know, one in eight of them are regular cannabis users, and so that's a much, much higher number. And so just, it's hard to kind of make that. I, I just don't have a denominator for either population, really. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, there's all this other stuff. There's this question. We do know that, um, that uh, there is an effect of marijuana on gastric motility, um, and so maybe that's part of it. Uh, again, I don't really know. Elevated cannabinoid that we don't know about, we discussed this, like something that is you know, in every single cannabis plant that we just haven't identified what this is. Um, kind of bad entourage effect, so you know, different combinations in some uh, strains or not. You know, Martha says that she's treated somebody and then switched her back to a different um, switched her back to a different product, and they didn't have the condition anymore. So that kind of lends some uh, some credence to this type of um, explanation. Um, genetic variability certainly possible, right? That's what I do when I sort of think about the genetics of, of different um, drugs. So there's a lot of different things that we just don't know. It's the bottom line, right? 
So other drugs, this is, gets right to your point, this is the synthetic cannabinoids. We absolutely, um, there, these things are, are in the literature. Um, we absolutely see this with people vaping. Um, we actually don't, I, I literally have not seen a single case with edibles. But, right. You know? Have so, you seen, but you've seen cases with smoked flour. Absolutely. And concentrates. And concentrates. But not edibles. With edibles, exactly. My patients smoke all the yeah. And so, you know, again, like I, I, I told you that I actually think that in some respects, edibles have, you know, higher toxicity for some conditions, um, and some adverse drug events. But I, I, I have not ever seen somebody with this. I, you know, I asked around to some of the other clinicians when I was in the emergency department today. They, they haven't seen this either. And so I, I'll tell you why I think this is, right? And I'm not aware of any topical cases as well. So, so I'm going to get into kind of the kinetics that I think explain this, and um, you know, when we sort of think about this therapeutic effect, right, so when you sort of get something, you kind of get in this therapeutic range too much or just whatever gives you an adverse drug event, and as I said, the people we see with this are using very high doses and a lot. We're talking to like, you know, a dabbing 10 to 20, you know, times a day, right? Like, that's a fair amount of, uh, of cannabinoid that they're ingesting. And so, yes, it would be surprising that they'd be up here, and you're gonna change your receptors with that type of uh, response. You know, some people don't use it enough, so they're not gonna get uh, kind of the symptoms. So inhalation, just to kind of go over the kinetics, I, I believe you guys all know this, but it's probably just worth going over once, right? You get this kind of right away, right? And so in some respects, it self-titrates. Because you smoke, you start to feel high, people you know, stop smoking and don't kind of overdo it quite as often, right? The effects last about two to three um, hours, although you kind of get rid of it all of it out of your system in about 20 hours, okay? Um, the, it's easily titratable in this way, right? Because people sort of titrate to whatever fact they want, okay? Edibles, however, the time to onset is 30 minutes. Peaks doesn't peak until two to three hours when the smoke is essentially gone, right? And it can last up to 12 hours, actually, the clinical effect, right? And so people generally actually don't have to use as often, right? And they don't, maybe they'll take a big dose, but most people that are experienced are not going to take a huge dose, right? And they're certainly not going to do it every two hours, right? Because it just, that wrecks you, right? Like that just completely wrecks people. And so they don't tend to do this. And so I just think part of this is like a dose phenomenon. People actually, the dose of the cumulative dose over a 24 hour period, I think is actually higher with, um, with inhalation than it is with when people are using edibles in general. Have you ever, um, neither of anyone, um, ever heard of a patient with this syndrome who strictly smokes flour and doesn't dab constantly yes. in that mm -hmm. case? So yeah. yes. And I do absolutely, do absolutely see that. Yeah. Do you yeah. ever look at how they ignite the flower. So smoking a joint as opposed to smoking a bowl with yeah. lighter. Uh, it's a good question and I don't think that um, people ask that enough. I, um, I have not asked that specific question um, enough. I, I will say that there is so much, um, you know, people that smoke bowls, as you guys know, very often smoke joints, and so there's a lot of sort of cross, and it's hard to kind of parse that out, whether or not, it, if it's more of a sort of lighter phenomenon versus, I, I, I don't know. If there could be a combination of cannabinoids that create sure. this. Now the question is, really is, is really, not, it's really vaporizing. Let's say if somebody's using a tax vaporizer, you're getting 90% of the cannabis, the cannabinoids with it, and you'll get a full entourage effect, sure. as, a, as opposed to 70% or 60% going up in smoke, sure. and then with that intense play. That's the question that you ask with regards to the yeah. temperature, as well as what you're getting. Regarding the edible use here, I think the, the explanation, one of the explanations could be the fact that, of the metabolite and it's the conversion factor, and how that may affect you know, things as we move past first pass in the liver, et cetera, et cetera, considering that you haven't seen a case yeah. with edibles. But I don't know the questions, going back to what questions are being asked at the ER, it's just a plus pos positive is for pot, yeah. and everything is looped together. Exactly, and, and, and but I will say that I have treated a lot of patients with this, and I am somebody that asks, just because this is my right. field, right? Okay. And so, and, and I haven't um, seen somebody like this, and I would have thought by now, I would have, you know what I mean, because I've taken care of hundreds of patients like this. Um, and I will also say that you, when you look at these kind of kinetics, I mean, these are perfect for pharmaceutical purposes, right? Because people don't have to sort of 
dose themselves every two hours. This is the kinet these are the kinetics that pharmaceutical companies want, right? Because it's kind of long activity and it's a sustained release type of product, right? I, I think I think this guy's question was different from what you're saying. Yeah. Well, he we, might have already hey, answered hey, it though. No, but but just just to, to just to your point real quick, I smoke joint samples. Yeah. And something that I don't think a lot of people realize is if you strike a lighter and it's and the flame is pointing up, um, a lot of the um, butane is being burned. Mm -hmm. If you strike your lighter to, to yeah, hit the bowl on the side, your hand, you yeah. can literally hear yeah. the amount of butane yeah. gas that pours out below the flame that sure. you're literally sucking in and inhaling. So what if a very small percentage of our population has an allergy to butane? And maybe very few people from time to time inhale pure butane when smoking a bowl in this way, and they have cyclical vomiting because they've got an, allerg an allergic reaction to butane. You said <laughs> so earlier you said something to look at. Earlier you said vaporizers. People that are using vaporizers have this problem times. So the question is, what type of vaporizers do they use? Are they using a butane-based uh, hash? Oh, right. Because so, there's vaporizers that use 12 volts. Sure. All right. And, so, and right. what I think we need to do as a group <laughs> is make a list of questions for Dr. Martin to ask <laughs> in the emergency room because we're he's very not going to know the answer to any of these things. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I, I think you know part of the reason why I think it, this is a this is good for me to come to talk to you guys, right? Because you see a different population than I. Right? Like, again, I have my, I know what I see in my emergency department. I am very much open to the possibility, uh, a range of possibilities that I haven't even considered that are causing this, right? And I think that you guys treat a lot of different patients, and actually you see this less often. So the question is, what are diff what is different about these patients? Try and figure it out, right? Because I think actually, if we can figure out what that is, then potentially we can get rid of this condition. That'd be great, right? Yeah. Like, so, you know, vaporization summary, as you guys know, kinetics approximate inhalation. Um, there are relatively fewer quote unquote inhaled irritants, um, and they're still associated with CHS. This is like the grossest vaporizer I think I've ever seen. <laughs> but anyway, so as I mentioned earlier, this condition is actually really difficult to treat. So, one study looked at these patients, and actually, um, the average over two years for the patients that came into the emergency department, not in our emergency department, this was at a different um, place, was almost $100,000 per patient. Can you imagine, these patients don't tend to have insurance. Like this is, this, is, this is crippling financially to people, right? So this is a really big deal, right? And part of it is that clinicians are doing too many tests after, rather than asking the right questions, right? Continuing CAT scan people when they shouldn't be, right? Like when actually they need symptomatic control is what they need, right? Um, but you know, this is a big deal. People getting admitted, you know, we have one guy that gets admitted to the ICU, actually throws himself up to sodiums that are incredibly low that can cause like seizures, right? And so, you know, this is a big deal for people. So is training going on for the ER docs? I mean, brought the ER docs together to say this is the list yeah. of four or five questions that we need to ask. So my group, right, like my group generally actually is pretty good because we're an academic center and we talk about this, we sort of, you know, uh, put this stuff out here. Uh, generally, the way we get this literature out is we, you know, publicate, we publish some of these, um, these things we get out on podcasts and things like that and say, these are the questions that you have to ask. And again, you know, not everybody that smokes bot and vomits has got the syndrome. You need to sort of be a little bit more sort of um, specific with your questions. And so the answer is yes, and it's becoming much more recognized. Although I don't think that we sort of hit everybody. We don't get every community doctor. We don't get every, um, you know, place in Colorado, right? So, you know, we, th this is part of the outreach that we need to do. But with CHS symptoms, the syndrome can be stopped if the people stop using the cannabis. Yeah, the so, part, right? so, so actually, yes, and let, we'll go over those data here uh, momentarily, and I'll show you the, the data on here. Um, you know, uh, so treatments like largely um, anti-emetics, and as I said, they're largely ineffective. So we give people Zofran, we give people things like Phenergan, right? Like, and they just don't get better. They continue to puke, um, and it is violent vomiting, right? Like. This, it's impressive syndrome when you see this. Um, Antipsychotics, we actually use a lot of haloperidol, which actually, frankly, is probably the most effective thing that I've found for people when they're acutely having symptoms. Um, 
capsaicin. I'm not sure how many people have heard about this, but essentially taking like capsaicin cream and rubbing it on the abdomen. This has been um, suggested, and there's some pathophysiology about it on um, the TRPV receptor, which is activated by this and may very well help with some of this stuff. The data isn't great on it. This is an article that's in publication right now, not, not mine, but somebody else. So this is when they gave the, um, the capsaicin, and these are the other drugs that they, they were giving. You can see this person kind of got you know, a bunch of drugs, then got capsaicin, then felt better enough to go home, right? Whereas this person got capsaicin, got a ton of other drugs, and still didn't feel better enough to go home. So, I mean, this demonstrates to me that capsaicin actually is not all that effective, frankly. I mean, you know, um, but again, we don't know. Some people sort of swear by this. Some clinicians swear by it. I, I um, when I review these these articles, I, I I am not as convinced that this is an end all be all in treatment for this condition. Kind but, of mimics the hot shower. Hey, well, exactly right. So it mimics the hot shower, and that's part of the kind of the theory behind it, right? I mean, there's a lot of hand waving on the pathophysiology, right? Like, but really, I think that's part of the reason why people tried it initially. Um, you know, but it's interesting to me, and uh, you know, a clinical trial needs to be done on this to, to see whether or not it works. Um, the only known cure is cessation of cannabis. This is um, this is the truth, right? So, in all the literature and all these reports out here, 62 of 64 patients had resolution after at 30 days after they stopped smoking. They didn't actually really follow up and do like drug screening and really sort of make sure that these people were abstinent. So it is certainly possible that these two patients were still smoking, right? That's possible. What we do know is that all 21 of whom that continued, continued to, to, to um, ingest cannabis, um, inhale cannabis, that is, had persistent symptoms. Right, so you can make a really good case and just say, it's not simplistic, just stop inhaling cannabis, go to another form, absorption yep and it's not exactly that's that that's open so you know this one other patient where I said we sort of tried to step back um, you know we he even you know had cessation for six months and then started smoking again and then actually um, had the sy syndrome again Right? And it's amazing, like you sort of hear these people, I had this one guy email me and said, listen, you know, I, I heard you, um, you know, saw you published on this, and, um, and he said, um, you know, I smoked for years, years ago, and I didn't even, this wasn't recognized as a condition, but I was vomiting, I stopped smoking pot, I didn't actually have the condition, and then just recently I would, you know, had it once and I started vomiting immediately again. I mean, it's impressive, actually, these patients' symptoms. Um, you know, but changing the route is certainly one possibility. And what's the frequency of these symptoms? Yeah, so it varies between patient. In general, um, you know, there are some patients that we see that will come in, you know, three times a week, right? Literally three times a week. Um, now, over the last couple of years, there are some patients that come in every couple of months. There are some patients that come in, you know, just really truly the minimum of three times a year. You know, so it really varies between the patients, and this probably has something to do with their usage patterns, but um, again, we, we just haven't documented this stuff well enough to be able to say, okay, this is definitely what it is, and this is the sort of level in which people are going to get it. Right. Um, just the other theory is that they pre-medicated by smoking a joint of CBD-rich stuff, yeah. like 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 50 to 1, yeah. something like that, that interferes with the CB1 you know, receptors up there, they may be able to take it in, in a different way and then not have the situation. Well, and the other Absolutely. thing is the, you know, pseudocholine, glycerol phosphocholine, um, you know, are known to make people feel less high. And, and now we have this other one to try too. Sure. So that's another, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So, you know, I've tried a lot of different things for patients. Um, you know, none of these have been really truly effective. Like, I sort of think about this, you know, um, really, Stopping the syndrome completely, and I, I believe probably requires cessation of smoking cannabis, right? That's what I believe has to happen. But controlling patient symptoms um, immediately is actually just as important because this, as I said, can be, I mean, it's really uncomfortable to puke your guts out for days on end, right? Like, um, so you know, we, we have to sort of get better treatments for that as well. But I think so, acetylcholine, yeah, acetylcholine could be a real yeah. strong candidate to try. Well, I think the listener is pretty 
Okay, you have whatever you want here, but, yeah. but I think there are two right here that you could really just incorporate to see what's happening. And do you think after somebody has gone with this syndrome, the fact that they're seeing vomiting on end, so their body must be becoming weaker too, you know? Oh, absolutely. And then what happens is it more like possible that they're getting more frequently and they're more like susceptible to the syndrome? Um, uh, well, certainly, as I said, you know, like I think that patients that end up getting this seem to be seem to get more susceptible and, and more prone to it in this one patient that I, I discussed with you. However, this other guy that I told you about that developed it first was uh, smoking dab. I actually just emailed with his girlfriend uh, last night in preparation for this, and I said, "Hey, look, you know, how's he doing?" Um, you know, and and she said, "Listen, he, he's still getting symptoms every couple of months, and we sort of have tried a bunch of different things. We've tried, um, you know, dissolvable antipsychotics because again, that's kind of like the halal that we use in the emergency department." And um, you know, it kind of works maybe a little bit. He seems to be getting it less frequently, and the only thing that I can identify that makes him get it less frequently is he is it decreases his overall dose. So he's not dabbing anymore, and he's not smoking quite as often. My patient this, just can't smoke during poison. This is strain specific, and once he quit during yeah. poison, no, you know, the problem's gone. Gone away. Yeah. Does the dehydration associated with this frequency or this uh, cyclical vomiting? cascading effect in the person. Yes, absolutely. You know, just like when people get any other vomiting condition, they get a little bit ketotic. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you get keto ketones are inherently emetogenic. They just make you puke. It's like when you exercise real hard, you get nauseous, right? Like that's what that's the ketones that are doing that. And so these patients kind of get that as well. And so we give them glucose in addition in order to help mitigate that issue. Um, but absolutely, yeah, that dehydration Did, is, is. Does the rehydration ever? Stop with the cyclical. So if you put a couple of liters of fluid yeah. into them through IV, um, they, does that stop it or do they just keep giving? So it's a good question. We are actually looking back at all the treatment that we got, and the answer is that I don't know. I think most of the time these patients are vomiting so much that physicians feel like they need to give a medication in order to get them better. That may not be the right thing. You know, some people may just need fluids. Um, but generally, same thing when people have a viral gastrointestinal infection, maybe they just need the glucose and that's it. That's what we would do at home for ourselves. But when they get to the emergency department, they tend to get medications. So the answer is we just don't know. Yet another thing. So um, we've talked about what's kind of worked for your patients a bit. We've sort of talked and covered this. And so, um, you know. So we don't know what causes this. We don't know how often this happens, right? Like I've said this, I don't know what the incidence to this condition is um, compared to you know, the number of people using in Colorado. We just have no idea. This condition gets a lot of press, frankly, more press than it probably even deserves based upon the number of people and the thing that I've demonstrated here, right? And so I think that that's a message to people as well that needs to get out there. It's like, hey, listen, this happens, and if this happens, then guess what, it's like an allergy in that you, you shouldn't be doing this, right? You shouldn't be smoking because you're probably gonna have it. It's like an adverse drug event to any other medication that we give, but it's a relatively low percentage of patients that gets this. It's not like everybody that uses this gets it. Clearly not, right? Like, you know, with the patients that you treat and the number of people that are using here in Colorado, right? Um, and you know, can people use products in other formulations? We've sort of talked through this. My suspicion is probably, right? Probably, um, but I just don't have enough sort of anecdotal evidence to support that statement at this point. And really, we still need to know what the best treatment is for acute treatment of these symptoms. Um, I, I really implore you all, as clinicians that are treating patients, to actually put your experience out there. Right? Like, so this kind of concept of you know, treating 10,000 patients and only having two, those types of numbers actually are not anywhere listed except for in your heads, right? Like, nobody has this stuff. And so I really actually suggest to you guys, you need to sort of publish this stuff in traditional and in non-traditional forums. So this is like, you know, Twitter, this is blogs, but this is also actually traditional medical um, uh, journals as well, because, you know, physicians in general, right, don't spend a lot of time on the blogs. They spend time in the medical literature. And so when we want to be able to actually educate our patients, 
we need to be able to actually point to these kind of publications. And so both of these things are important. The way we get to the patients is by the blogs and the Twitter and all that stuff, right? But the way we get to the medical community is by this traditional stuff. And so that's kind of a, a suggestion that I, I would have for you. Um, you know, keep doing what you're doing, right? But also document what you're seeing because actually, you know, um, going through your records and actually demonstrating that this isn't like, you know, a one out of every two patients is actually an important thing. You know, the patients I see are the sick ones, right? Like if I just did publications in the emergency department patients, it would look like every single drug out there was, you know, an acutely life-threatening drug, right? And so, and so that's the thing, right? And no we, one should ever eat a peanut. Well, that's right, you know, and that's exactly right. And everybody with chest pain's got a heart attack, right? Like, you know, like, it, but, but, you know, that's clearly not what the situation is. And so, so how do we do that? Is that we start to actually generate this kind of like this kind of cohort that there are patients that are treated successfully with and without adverse drug events, so that we know what to tell our patients when we're recommending things for them. Um, so in summary, look, this is associated with heavy cannabis use. I actually don't believe that people that just smoke once a week actually develop this condition. I really think that this is really high, heavy, heavy use, smoked, you know, 10 plus times a day is what I think the, these patients that are getting it. And I don't think that everybody that does that gets this condition. I think that those are the people that do go on to get the condition, but that doesn't mean all of them do. Um, the only known cure for this condition at this juncture is cessation. We need to look at other things. There's a lot we don't know in that way. Um, and, I, and I actually think that your group here can help educate the patients and actually get more information out there so that everybody learns more about this. Um, what questions? Now we've answered a lot. Um, now, obviously, we don't want any patients having an adverse reaction yeah. or something, but from a cost perspective, um, from that 95000 yeah. dollars you know, physicians have very practice patterns, as you know, especially in the ED, and so the patient's coming in with an undifferentiated diagnosis. And so one, one physician's gonna, you know, run this test, another physician's gonna run something else. So in a way, that 95,000, depending on the timestamp of, okay, patient A, you know, when did you actually admit that you were smoking pot or using pot? So that might have not have been until much longer in the visit, which increases costs, and just the different, you know, practice patterns. I actually, you know, and let me speak to that a little bit. I actually think that that, con that cost here in Colorado is much lower because for two reasons. Physicians don't ask about it and because patients don't mind talking about it, right? Like we just have a destigmatized environment here. And so, um, you know, we, that cost is much lower. However, I'll tell you that my colleagues, no, I don't think that everybody needs to have, you know, blood work. I don't think that, I clearly don't think that everybody needs to have a CAT scan. In fact, you know, None of these patients, after we need to make the diagnosis, need to have that stuff unless something's different, unless they look sick and something is different than their past presentations. Does that kind of speak to your point a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Um, going back to the man that you spoke about who had symptoms before um, this was even kind of described, does that maybe like indicate that this was yeah. this, this was happening before? you know, all of this medical research started happening. Absolutely, and I, and I do believe that there were cases um, before this was described, right? Like I, I, yeah, on the symptoms or the possible causes slide, you have one of those as genetics or some absolutely. kind of genetic disorder. On that slide, too, you, have, you mentioned something about gastro. Um, Gastromotility? Yeah. yeah, is that kind of contra contradicted even though that, or because people are mostly dabbing or smoking this? Like you said, there was no, possible Yeah, so, so um, what has been shown is, is that, um, you know, this was one study basically, and people that smoked marijuana actually had decreased gastric emptying. So that meant that the sphincter at the bottom of the, the stomach just wasn't sort of opening quite as, as, as briskly as others. You know, this wasn't done with a range of different products. This was people that smoked um, uh, cannabis, you know, smoked pot, and I, I don't, I can't remember what product they used. It was probably the Mississippi product when they did that study. And you know, they weren't necessarily looking at uh, nausea. They were, I think, that they were doing that study when they were sort of thinking about utilizing this for appetite stimulation. Um, and, and so um, that's interesting because if you sort of think that it causes you know, decreased gastric motility, people's stomach is just not emptying, 
yeah, it, you know, that makes you throw up, right? And so, so that's one potential um, etiology. We see this with diabetics, right? Um, that they have decreased gastric emptying, and that's due to neuropathy, essentially. The question is, you asked, you were asking us to collect the data and try to give you the information, and you know, because we see from your end, but as a physician on this side, the movement from your end, from you, not you, but the, the establishment kind of situation, to really take a step forward to try to form alliances Absolutely. with people like myself, that is not happening. That has not, I don't have seen that happen in over a number of years, but I'm just asking where the philosophy will begin to shift yep. on the traditional medicine way to join forces with the people to try to bring the information together and reduce the stigma and get the evaluation that data that you're looking at. Okay, so, so, how about this? If, if we work together to create a questionnaire for our members, and we have close to 100 members actually, about 60% of whom are active physicians, we can put together a questionnaire and, and try to bridge that gap on this subject where I can send it out to all the members and they can respond back and we can hopefully get him some data. Well, it's a quality. Right, but question. more importantly was my question yeah. of the frame of yeah. mind. Because uh, I don't see the people reaching out like you're Say you're going to the dean of the school and he's going to make a pronouncement. He says, with cannabis, we're going to have this forward thinking yep. and we're going to try to get answers on these questions. Sure. So, so the answer is, is the way we do that is by interactions like this, right? Um, where we come in and we sort of, uh, we talk to you, you talk to, to us, and you know, again, I sort of sit somewhere in between, right? And so we start to open these dialogues. We also start to run these clinical trials, right? Like we're, we are doing at the University of Colorado, and we start to look at those things. And I think that um, ultimately, the point that you raise is a good one. This has got to be a two-way street, right? Like we need to come to you; you have to come to us. And you know, so what do I have to offer you guys? What I have is fleets of medical students that would be happy to review records, right? Like and things like that. I have people, um, you know, that know how to write medical literature that get into sort of you know clinical journals. Those are the types of things that I can offer if um, if we start to kind of come up with these questions and these unknown. Um, these unknowns that we want to try and help find an answer to, we come up with study designs together. The way we do this is by sort of, again, like this, this crosstalk and sitting down at the same t uh, table as people, me hearing about what you're seeing and you hearing about what I'm seeing, and that way we can say, well, that's not really what I'm seeing in these patients, and realistically, you know, I'm open to the, this potential treatment because we don't know. And I think that that's the first step, is admitting that, right? Like, we don't know because we're all biased by where we sit and the patients that we see. What about anything in the social economic class? Because you're saying most of these patients that you're seeing are not, not having insurance, right? Yep. So we know that there's a definite correlation between social economic class and people's health. So what about that? Maybe they're not eating their fruits and vegetables and kind of can't afford it. So that's affecting their stomach tissue or something. So maybe that could impact it. Well. Yeah, I, I think it's certainly possible. I, I generally, I'll tell you that the uh, you know the patients that tend to use this heavy amount are you know I'll just sort of stereotype, although it clearly doesn't apply to everybody, is the kind of late twenties year old male, right? Like the you know that's the person that we're seeing with this condition in general, right? Like that's if I had to sort of give you what this patient looks like, that's who they are when I see them in the emergency department. Have I seen women with it? Absolutely. Have I seen sort of um, older people with it? Absolutely. Uh, but I'll say the predominant is like sort of the 28-ish year old male that's been um, smoking for a long time since they've been in their teens and now is using very, very heavily. That's generally the patient we see. And that's why I know why he's using heavily because he's, he's trying to activate his, the remaining receptors that he has because he's using the concentration that this flower wouldn't work for him. But this is, I mean, in my mind, it's complicated if you want. And it is. It needs to be down to that finite level. But in a broad sense, coming away from this lecture, this is, I take away, this is not rocket science. The person is male, and they present this. And you can tell them this and go from there. You can make certain points and really do 99% of what you need to do to make things better. The hard thing, frankly, though, is, is with any 
any time we try and change people's behavior or something that they're doing this often in a day, I mean, I can't change people watching TV for 10 hours a day either. And that's actually something that's really a, a struggle. Like, you know, I described this patient to you that, that we know, we've sort of tried a bunch of different things. And like, you know, with every step, I say, listen, if this doesn't work, you're gonna have to stop smoking, right? Like that's the bottom line. And his girlfriend says, listen, he's gonna do what he's gonna do with his health right now. And it's because he's a 20 something year old kid, right? And he's like, addicted, and he's, you know, whatever it is. And again, yeah. he needs therapy. It's a combination exactly. factor of just not agreeing to it. It's therapy also involved. Absolutely. Let's thank Dr. Lonnie Vance. So reach out. I, I believe um, uh, Lewis here has got all, you know, we'll have the slides, but um, yeah, reach out if you have any questions. And um, yeah, again, you know, like having these conversations, I think, is the right step. And I think, you know, like I said, like having these conversations is the right step. Like we're going to have to have these conversations again. And I think that's the right step. And I think, you know, frankly, I think going forward, what we really need is a cohort of people, you know, case control type of uh, study, and just see what happens. Because I actually think that the while all the adverse drug events end up in the news, it's actually the vast minority of people. And, and, and that message isn't being sort of put out there the way it, it should be. And it's because the bad stuff happens and that's what gets the headlines, right? But I think one more big step that could come out of this meeting too, is if you take from here, you're saying, okay, yeah. I'm going to set up an advisory, I'm going to go back to University Hospital and set up an advisory board or a new board to look at this problem with the cannabis people, and you put together five people from our side, and five people from the traditional medicine, or whatever, too, and we begin to meet on a regular basis, and we talk about this issue, and but we having just that example could well, start it. What I want to do is be a facilitator. As I said, my, my, my time has become so incredibly um, tax because of the other research I do and because of the other clinical practice that I that I have. I am interested in this because I think I can help be a facilitator and I have some of the data that people can help use and I offer resources to you but what I can't do is be the head of a new coalition because that's a significant time investment that I just, just frankly I frankly just don't don't have but I can help get people together in a room. I can help you have resources to do this. I can also tell tell people that, hey look, you know, these guys are willing to work with you. Let's actually, if you want to do this, I can hook you up with them and do that stuff. Well, I and I'm always happy to, to do that. The We're there. Yeah. We're there. Yeah. Yeah. And we should yeah. take advantage of the, this opportunity. Yeah. Because right. not too many from the university has come. And this is an opportunity that we need to grow on. And if you can't be there directly, maybe yeah. somebody and else, again, you can hand it off to somebody who we can meet with on a regular basis. Exactly. I, I think that would be great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. I'm contact audit. Um, if there's any questions, and thank you for coming. I'd love to do a questionnaire all the time.